touch briefly before I go into my message. As Pastor Kurt said last week, we are a faith-based program. So this program is built on a firm foundation of God. Amen. Okay? Um, so when you come here, you will receive the word. You will receive spiritual nourishment as well as physical nourishment. So you will receive that. Okay? Our goal is to provide, like I said, spiritual and, spirit, spirit, spiritual and physical nourishment so you can feel the presence of God in your lives and in your hearts. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So with that, let's begin with the prayer. Almighty God, we ask you to bless us in this place. Here, may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here, may the doubting find faith and the content be awakened. Here, may the tempted find help and the sorrowful be renewed. Here, may the believer be encouraged and the lost find salvation. Forgive our sins and cleanse our hearts. Inhabit our praises as we worship. And speak to us through your word, all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. My message today is about understanding discouragement. And I'll be referring to Kings 1, chapter 19. So let's put this in our wise spiritual lens. And before we do, I want to start with a, a short, funny story. So, one day, a man was driving home. And on his way home, he decided to, um, as he was driving home, he, he saw the Little League Baseball play at the park playing a game. So before he went home, he decided to stop by and watch the game. So he, he got out of his car, he went, and he sat behind the first baseline where it was a kid, one of the kids, one of the players was sitting. And he asked the player, he asked the kid, he was like, what's the score? And the kid replied, we're behind 14 to nothing. And he had a big smile on his face. And the man replied, really? I have to say, you don't look very discouraged. And the little boy looked puzzled at him. And he says, discouraged? Why should we be discouraged? We haven't even had our up to bat yet. If you guys play baseball, you guys can hear that. <laughs> but we just don't go on. But <laughs> so I read it. So with that story, with that story, I connected to one word. And that's discouraged. I read, a rec I read an article an interesting fact about Chinese bamboo trees. Chinese bamboo trees do absolutely nothing in their growth for the first four years. And then suddenly, sometime during the fifth year, it'll shoot up more than 90 feet within 60 days. And I feel that our lives, our lives are often like a bamboo tree, right? Because sometimes we put forth the effort and we put forth the effort, and we put forth the effort, right? And nothing seems to happen. And then what happens? We become discouraged, right? So for me, just a personal testimony, for me, I experienced a situation not so long ago where I had made an achievement that had a positive impact on, on people's lives. But as the moment faded, I started to think. I started thinking of discouraging thoughts, like I really didn't make a difference. And that I wasn't good enough to make a difference in anybody's life. But I realized that the enemy will come. The enemy will come undetected to make us internalize all of our own personal flaws against ourselves and to give up on God. See, technically I call that the, the midway checkpoint. 
That's the midway checkpoint. The point of no return. The place where I felt like I couldn't start over, but I couldn't quit either. I was at that midway checkpoint. The point where my achievements didn't match my energy or my spirit anymore. See, sometimes when we begin something new, when we begin something new, our enthusiasm, our faith, for that particular scenario or that situation, it'll push us forward, correct? Correct? Yes. However, when we reach that midway checkpoint, sometimes those negative thoughts start to break through. So for me, like I said, I begin to internalize my own personal flaws against myself, and I discredit my whole progress because I was discouraged. See, what seemed possible all of a sudden seemed impossible. And what I realized then is the midway checkpoint, that's where the enemy lingers, right? That's where he lingers to deceive us into thinking that God is not anywhere near our midway checkpoint, right? It's only him lingering there, the enemy. Do you know the difference between being discouraged and discouragement and having a hold on you? Do you know the difference? See, when, when you are discouraged, you are still in control of all of your emotions. All of your emotions. But see, when discouragement has a hold on you, it begins to take control over your life. Right? See, typically we start off discouraged. We have total control of our emotions. And then it can happen suddenly. It can go zero to 100 real quick and discourage, discouragement all of a sudden got a hold of you. It's taking control of your life. See, the goal of the enemy is to make us unproductive for God and to drag us deep down into the belly of the well, right? However, the truth is discouragement is an instrument. It's a tool. It's a tool that the enemy uses against us. Have you ever heard the old legend about when the enemy decided to hold a garage sale? Has anybody ever heard that story? So the story goes like this. It's an old legend that the enemy was going out of business. And he decided to sell all of his tools to whoever paid the highest price. So one night, he opened up his doors to his customers, and he showcased all of his tools. Hate, jealousy, fear, deceit, and many more. But see, somewhere in the dark corner of the room was a very old, harmless, worn out tool. Looking as if it's been used throughout eternity. And it had the highest price of them all. So somebody asked the enemy, what was that tool? What was that instrument? And why was the price so high? And the enemy looked at the customer and then he turned back and he looked deep dark in the corner and he smiled. And he said, discouragement. He went on to say this. This is what he told his customer. Discouragement, that tool is the most expensive tool because it is the one I use on people the most. When nothing else works, I enter in their minds and their hearts and nobody notices. And once I am there, I get them discouraged. I can get them discouraged and I can make them do whatever I want them to do. This tool is so worn out because I've been using it since the dawn of humanity and it works for everybody. Very few people know this tool belongs to me. When they get discouraged and lose hope, they think that it's them to blame or other people or the world around them. When people hit obstacles in their life, they encounter problems, but when they get discouraged, when they get discouraged, when they lose hope and faith, that's just me doing my job. So that's the old legend about 
when the enemy decides to open up his doors and have a garage sale. See, discouragement is the enemy's most powerful instrument to use against us because it is undetected, like carbon monoxide. I don't know if I said that right. Carbon monoxide. <laughs> Making it harder for us to overcome. He wants us to internalize all of our own personal flaws against us and to give up on God and to have a lack of hope and faith. He wants us to feel the weight on our spirits by making us believe a whole different reality. See, once the enemy attacks our spirit with his discouragement tool, we begin to question everything and everyone. We begin to question our progress and our journey. Think about it. Let's think about it for a minute. The enemy can't hurt God directly. He can't just waltz up into heaven and take a stronghold on God. Right? He uses an attempt to weaken God's promises and lessen God's following. He uses our weaknesses, our weaknesses, and what's close to us to mask our reality with God and to turn on ourselves. So, Let's talk briefly about when Elijah battled with discouragement. So, just a little backstory about Elijah. Elijah's name means God is my strength. And he was a bold, direct to the point prophet of God. He shot from the hip. And by speaking the prophecies of God, he made fierce enemies. Fierce enemies. But his enemies could not overpower him. God appointed Elijah to go before kings, kings, to bring the message of warning and repentance. Elijah was the one that announced the drought for many years. He was also the one to bring a young boy back to life. But one of his greatest public miracles for Elijah was the showdown on the mountain between 850 false prophets and God. Right? So Elijah did all these great things. His name was God is my strength. Right? So shortly after the showdown on the mountaintop, Elijah went into hiding deep into the wilderness because he was discouraged. He was discouraged because he thought the people did not honor or obey God and that all of God's prophets were dead. That discouraged him. A man that did, did miracles, it discouraged him. He was still discouraged. So in the, world, in the wilderness, he found a tree. And there God provided an angel to provide him physical provisions by giving him food and water and letting him rest. Right? See, I felt like with that, Elijah was at his midway checkpoint. He was at his midway checkpoint. He couldn't go back. He couldn't start over. But he couldn't quit either. Right? So Elijah traveled for 40 days and 40 nights to the same mountain where Moses saw the burning bush. So there in the cave, God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? In our moments of despair and discouragement, God will come to us. He will come to us and ask us, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? So God expressed, I mean, so Elijah expressed his discouragement to God. And that's when God told Elijah to stand on top of the mountain. And when Elijah went to stand on top of the mountain, there a strong wind blew. The wind was so strong that it broke the rocks into pieces. And after the wind was an earthquake, followed up with a mighty firestorm, all on top of the rock, with Elijah up there all by himself, right? And after the mighty firestorm, on a gentle breath, a gentle breath of wind, Elijah caught a faint whisper, a gentle breath of wind. And it was God speaking with a small voice, 
See, when, when discouragement has taken a hold of us, in that moment, our focus shifts. Right? It shifts. All we have to do is just seek him, seek God. Stand still, and on a gentle breath of wind, God will speak to us in a faint whisper. Amen. He'll let us know that we, each and every one of us, is his child. And no one or nothing is impossible for him. Amen. 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 Our action items for the week are first and foremost, give praise. Then I want you to remember, whenever you feel discouraged, whenever you feel unloved, unimportant, remember who you belong to. Remember who you belong to. You belong to a God that will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you in that order. Correct? Peter told us, it's written, Peter told us, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It is written. That's God's truth. Correct? Amen? Amen. Amen. Remember, we, each and every single one of us, is a child of God. We are heir of the kingdom, and we have been made perfect in God. We need to reject discouragement for what it is. It's a desperate attempt from a false messenger to steal from us our peace and our faith in God. Right? See, the reason most people get discouraged is that they tend to look how far they still have to go instead of how far they have come. Amen. Look how far we have come. Just look at it. Do not let the enemy use his most powerful tool to discredit the progress and the journey. That's yours and God's. It may seem impossible now, but through God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. So typically, I have a story or an illustration to tell that relates to my message towards the end of my messages. But since Thanksgiving is next week, I wanted to end with a different story. So I'm going to share this story with you guys. Don't you guys like my stories? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there was a philosophy professor that stood before his class with, with some items on the table. And when the class began to, to sit down, he started to, he, what he did is he picked up a large empty jar and he began to fill it with rocks. After he filled it with rocks, he stopped. And then he asked the class, was the jar full? The class agreed it was. So then he picked up a box of gravel and he poured the gravel into the jar. He slightly shook the jar and the gravel rolled into the open areas between the rocks. He then asked the class again, was the jar full? The class agreed again it was. He then picked up a box of sand and poured it into the jar. The sand filled up everything else inside the jar. He then asked once more if the jar was full. The class responded, yes. The professor went on to say, this is what he taught his class. Now I want you to recognize that this large jar represents your life. The rocks are the most important things to you, your family your partner, your children, your health. Things that if everything else was lost and only they remain, your life would still be full. The gravel is all the other things that matter. 
like your clothing, your house, your car, just all the other little things, right? The sand is everything else, the small stuff. See, if you put the sand in first, if you put the sand in first into the jar, there is no room for the gravel or the rocks. There's no room for the most important things in your life if you put in the small stuff that matters first, right? And it's the same goes for your life. If you spend all of your time and energy on the small stuff, you will never have room for the things that are important to you. Pay attention to the things that are critical to your happiness and your peace. Take care of the rocks first, the things that really matter, because the rest is just sand. Did you guys like that story? Yes. All right.